Song of Solomon. And I, I want to say this as we begin. Look at, look at chapter 1, verse 1, Song of Solomon, right after Ecclesiastes, right before Isaiah. And you get this, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. This is a song. That's, that's one of the things that we want. Holy of Holies. What does that mean? King of Kings. What does that mean? This is the Song of Songs, which means what? It means this, this is the best. This is the most excellent. This Song of Songs. You want to you wanted just think right off. God gave us this to sing. This is a song. And it's not just any song. It's the best of the songs. It's the Song of Songs. This is the most excellent, the one that is above. It means that no man has ever sung a better song. No man has ever written a better song. If you call something the song of songs, that means that there isn't one that is a song that is a better song. Because this is the song. It's like saying holy of holies. You can't say there's a more holy place than the holy of holies because it is the holy of all holies. And the same thing of King of Kings. We don't call Christ King of Kings because there are several kings that are actually higher than him. When you say that this is the song of all songs, that means that there's never been one song, there's never been one written that it's equal. It surpasses every other song. This is the best song, not only of the human songs. This is inspired by God. This is the Spirit of God saying this. All Scripture is God-breathed. God is telling us. This isn't just Solomon's opinion or my opinion. The Spirit's speaking here. Brethren, hear God's voice in this. We really need to hear God speak. When you feel like singing a love song, do you know what this is saying to us? There isn't one that is better than this one. This is the, this is the love song of the ages. That's what, that, that's what song of song means. Don't, don't pass over that ever again lightly. Because you shouldn't, you know what, that kind of repetition, when you hear Lord of Lords, when you hear that repetition, or when you hear that kind of emphasis, the Holy of Holies, you're not supposed to step, you're not supposed to just ignore that and say, well, there's a lot of places that are just as holy as that. No, what this is saying is, th this, is the, this is the best of the love songs, and it doesn't get any better than this. That's the idea. And Ecclesiastes is a very fitting introduction vanity of vanities that's how that's how we're ushered in it gives place to the song of songs you see what Solomon is doing he's taking us from emptiness vanity of vanities emptiness of emptiness and he's taking us into the to fulfillment to blessing now listen I know Spurgeon is a patron saint to many of us, um, but he's a man. This is a man's opinion. This isn't Scripture, but listen to him. I told you before, he preached, I believe, 63 sermons, all of them on the Song of Solomon having to do with Christ and the church. Listen to what he says. And I'm, I'm asking you, do you think he's speaking the truth when he says this? Listen, he says, this is to quote him, certain theologians have doubted the inspiration of Solomon's song. Other theologians have conceived it to be nothing more than a specimen of ancient love song. Some have been afraid to preach from it. The true reason, listen to, listen to what his opinion is, the true reason for all this avoidance of one of the most heavenly portions of God's Word lies in the fact that the spirit of this song is not easily attained. Its music belongs to the higher spiritual life, and it has no charm 
for unspiritual ears. The song occupies a sacred enclosure into which none may enter unprepared. Put off your shoes for the place whereon you standest is holy ground, is the warning voice from its secret tabernacles. And he says this, the historical books of your Bible, he compares to the outer court of the temple. The Gospels, the Epistles, and the Psalms bring us into the holy place or the court of the priests. But he says this, the Song of Solomon is the most holy place. He says the Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. That's his estimation. It's the Holy of Holies before which the veil still hangs to many an untaught believer. It is not all the saints who can enter here, for they have not yet attained unto the holy confidence of faith and that exceeding familiarity of love which will permit them to commune in conjugal love with the great bridegroom. The song is, in truth, a book for full-grown Christians. It takes a man who has leaned his head upon the bosom of his master and been baptized with his baptism to ascend the lofty mountains of love on which the spouse stands with her beloved. The Song of Solomon from the first verse to the last will be clear to those who have received an unction from the Holy One and know all things, as John told us in 1 John 2.20. You're aware, dear friends, there are very few commentaries upon the epistles of John. We find 50 commentaries upon any one book of St. Paul, but you'll hardly find one upon John. Why? Is the book too difficult? The words are very simple. There's hardly a word of four syllables anywhere in John's epistles. Ah, but they're so saturated through and through with the spirit of love, which also perfumes this book of Solomon, that those who are not taught in the school of communion cry out, we cannot read it, it's sealed. The Song of Solomon is a golden casket of which love is the key rather than learning. Those who have not attained unto the heights of affection, those who have not been educated by familiar intercourse with Jesus, cannot come near to this mine of treasure, seeing it's hid from the eyes of all living and kept closed from the fowls of heaven. Oh, for the soaring eagle wing of John and the far-seeing dove's eyes of Solomon, but the most of us are blind and cannot see afar off. May God be pleased to make us grow in grace and give us so much of the Holy Spirit that with feet like hinds' feet we may stand upon the high places of Scripture and this morning have some near and dear intercourse with Christ Jesus. And that's my desire. I think he's right. That's why I quote that. So, where are we today? Today, I just, I simply want to take you to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and to two very simple verses, really. Look at verse 15. 15 and 16. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. So, the love song of love songs. Here's Christ, verse 15. To his church, to his people, to you that he has bought with his blood. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. And you have to recognize. Ephesians 5 tells us very clearly he is at work to remove the blemishes. We have our share of blemishes, folks. We come dirty, we cor come t corrupt and foul, depraved and wretched. And he is in the business of washing and making us beautiful for himself. And he looks at us. And this is the way he sees us. He really has this love. He really has this affection. 
He says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. He says it twice. Your eyes are doves. And then she, the church, responds, looking at him. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green. I don't have a message on that, but I'm sure somebody does. Our couch is green. Hey. Maybe something will come to me on that. Anyway, brethren, here's the thing. What makes the Song of Solomon especially helpful to us is that, it, you know what? I love Revelation 2 and 3 because Jesus specifically speaks to his churches. I like that because those were real people that lived then. We are real people living now. I love it when we get Christ's perspective and he looks at his church and he speaks. And that's what we have here. He's, he's speaking. And <clears throat> we are speaking. He speaks in 15. We speak in 16. And what we have is, you, you see it, what I've called this message is mutual manifestations of love. And you see it. He expresses his affection for her. She expresses her affection for him. And the, the thing is, we know how we feel about Christ. Every one of us, we have a way, and I recognize it can fluctuate, but you have an idea about generally how you feel about Christ. Why? Because you feel it. Nobody else feels it. He doesn't feel it for you. I mean, we know the level of attraction we have for him. And look, if we're genuine Christians, we know that we love the unseen Christ. We haven't seen him, but we love him. There is an attraction. And what makes this song so precious is that we get to hear the God-inspired, the Song of Solomon, it's inspired. But we get to hear the God-inspired uh, words as to how he feels towards us and the attraction he has for us. And you see it right there in verse 15. Can't get away from it. And it's, it's something we would hardly believe. It's like, ah, oh, we feel wretched after what I said, what after I did, the thoughts I've had. Ah, oh, we can feel so unclean. Can you imagine? I mean, you feel dirty, you feel ugly. And then he looks at us and says, you're attractive. I mean, we can hardly believe it. Nine times you'll find it here, my love. You see it down in 2-2. As a lily among brambles, so is my love. Nine times our Lord calls his church my love. She never uses that term. Never. But just notice. Notice 2.10. I want you to see the way he speaks. She says, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise. Notice, notice all the titles that he gives to her. All the expressions of affection. My love. Arise, my love. My beautiful one, and come away. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to be alone with him. You jump over to Song of Solomon 5, 1. Look at, look at chapter 5 and verse 1. He says this, I came to my garden. That's, that's how he views us, as his garden. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride, you go to verse 2. Is it 2 that I want? Oh yeah, open open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. And you just see the kind of expressions there. Now, I, I want to say something to you that might not register it at the beginning here. But if I were to ask you, which of the two verses, verse 15 or verse 16, in chapter 1, which of the two most fully expresses Christ 
affection for us and his love for us. And I, I, I think that it's pretty easy. I mean, if I said, which one would you pick? Which one of these two here seems to give the greatest expression to his, his love towards us? And you, you would immediately say, well, obviously, verse 15. Because verse 16 isn't him expressing his love towards us. It's her expressing her love to him. And you would be absolutely right in making that observation. But the point here is this, that us, us having an affection for Christ, I want you to think about this. Look, there is something, there is an expression of his love in our feeling the way we feel towards him. I want you to, I, I want you to feel something here. Christ is calling us away. Did you, did, my love, my perfect one, my dove, my garden, my sister, my bride, my love, come away. Listen, well, this is the reason this is the Holy of Holies. What do you think the Holy of Holies is? The Holy of Holies is where God is. It's where His presence, God's presence is everywhere. But the Holy of Holies is that place where His presence is most manifest. And remember what we're talking about? Christ said, I will manifest myself. Brethren, what does it mean for Christ to manifest himself? I will love him and manifest myself. Loving manifestations. That is the Holy of Holies. That is the place of manifestation. That is where you want to be. And you know what he's saying to you, Christian? Come away. Come away. I want to see your eyes. I want to hear your voice. That's, that Christ clearly beckons us to come away. That God is calling us into the secret place. We know that that is the life of the Christian. And you know what it says? You know what it says over in Revelation? Jesus said to the conquerors, he says, you know what? I'll give you, if you conquer, I'll give you some of the hidden manna. And you know what else he says? I'm going to give you a white stone. Do you know what's on that stone? Have you ever read? Do you remember? What's on that stone? A name. And you know what he specifically says? He says this. A new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Listen to how he speaks. My love, my dove, my garden, my, my perfect one. He's got names for his beloved that no one else is going to know except you and him. Brethren, does your heart not ache for what they lost in the garden? Adam walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. Now we derive that, we assume that, because he came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and that's when he discovered them hiding. But isn't that what you long for? I mean, Ruby and I were out on a hike, and, and we discovered this little, we discover things all the time, but we discovered this little group of homes just nestled in all these flowers and beauty and everything. And we just thought, we could just live there forever. And it's, in, but I, but the thought that came to me was, yes, if the Lord came and walked with us in the cool of the day in this place. Because I don't want to be there if that doesn't happen. And that's what he's doing is he's calling us away. And for us, that excites our heart. Like, wow, how could he even feel this way? Because he chose to redeem you and make you his bride and beautify you and get rid of every spot and every wrinkle and every blemish. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's making you beautiful. And he is going to take you. There is going to be this supper table of the lamb. This is going to be, there's going to be a wedding. And we know the bride has prepared herself. And this thing is going to be so glorious in the end. And the greatest intimacy, the greatest beauty, the greatest attraction, the greatest love story that you can find among men is only the shadow. This is the reality. That's what that that's all the marriages in this world are just uh, all the, all the sum of them. This is the glory here. This is the fullness here. 
But the unexpected manifestation of love is, is just that what she says in 16, notice this. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Do you all see that? Here's, here's the thing. You know what strikes me? The, the reason that I'm doing this message is because when I look at that, I said, you know what? That in itself is an expression of his love to me because you know what it says? Think, think with me. What does Christ have to do to you and do in you to get you to talk that way about him? Have you ever, just think about that. Notice, notice here, notice chapter 2, verse 3. This is she. Notice what she's saying. As I look all through the song, I find the most ex amazing expressions that come from the church. With great delight, I sat in his shadow. Or go to 2.5. She says, I'm sick with love. Now we could keep going. I mean, you know this. Others say, what is your beloved more than another beloved? Oh, most beautiful among women. What is your beloved more than another beloved? And she responds with, my beloved is radiant. The New American Standard says dazzling and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. Don't we sing that? What's the song? What is it? No, that says he's a chief among 10,000. Do you sing that here? Yes. We should sing that sometime. Lily of the Bat. Yeah, that's it. But, but listen to what she's saying here. Distinguished. The, the, the New King James says chief among 10,000. The New American Standard says outstanding among 10,000. In 516, she says he is altogether desirable. The King James says altogether lovely. I mean, who can put what a Christian has felt? about Christ into words. None, none but his loved ones know, as it says in another song. But this captures it. I mean, this captures it. We find him altogether desirable, altogether lovely. Do you ever think those words? Certainly, if you're a genuine Christian, those words come into your mind when you think about Christ. I mean, if there's, listen, folks. Through the years, I've had to sit down with any number of people to talk to them about where they're at spiritually. People come along all through, all through the years. They want to be baptized. They want to, they want to join the church. And so I've interviewed, I, I, I can't lost number, but the, you know the fact is, when you sit down with somebody, what think ye of Christ? Just watch how people answer. It'll tell you everything you need to know. It, it really does. People that stay stammer and stumble and they really don't have anything to say and they keep going back to themselves and it's just you know it's a bunch of religious what do they think of christ this this is it i'm, I'm speaking to you who feel this not to everybody i'm just asking this question have you ever really considered what christ's love has done for you that makes it possible for you to delight in him i mean do you hear what i'm saying listen I can look around the world. You know this. I can look around the world and I can find young men who are attracted to video games. That's common. That's normal. I can find men who are attracted to looking at women on the internet. That's normal. I can find young ladies that, that want to you know, put makeup on and beautiful clothes. and There's, there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing odd about that. But the fact is, for me to find Christ beautiful, I mean, what a, what a massive expression of his love towards me. Because the truth is, by nature, we're just a bunch of cross-eyed people. We see things upside down. Yes, yes, the fact is, verse 15 there should blow us away that Christ thinks that way about us. But so should verse 16. You, get, you have these passionate expressions of attraction. We, we're attracted to him. Something has happened in my heart. Listen, there was a day when for me to look at a fast motorcycle, yep, that's not unusual. To, to have people that go after money, to have men that love sports, 
to have women that love clothes and they love all their friends and they love to do their hair a certain way. And he's just, folks, th that's, that's all normal. That's where we see it everywhere, everywhere in this world. People that are preoccupied and attracted to movies, to making money, to their jobs, to their children, to their, to their educational advances. I mean, we find all sorts of stuff. You know, to, to find people that are obsessed with this, and that's very common. But you look around in this world, and just be honest, where are the people who find Christ altogether lovely? Do you know how rare that is? Do you recognize that if you feel longings in your heart for Christ, that is, folks, that's supernatural. None of us have mothers that bear children that naturally have that desire. Seminaries don't produce that desire. There's only one place it comes from. To find a man and woman child in this world whose heart jumps at the name of Christ. Look around. Where are they? Go through Tesco. Go up and down the streets. Go, go into the city center. I mean, just yell out, hey, if you're in the city center here and you love Christ, shout. Oh, you'll get shouting. It'll be all profanity. The thing to ask, we really want to ask is, where do people like this come from who truly in the depths of their heart, their being, they say, Christ, oh, he's altogether lovely. It, because we didn't always think that way. That, that's, that's just a reality. How did we think? Well, the, the rea here's what Isaiah, remember how Isaiah said? He had no form, we just read this, no form or majesty or comeliness that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah 53, 3, despised, rejected of men as one from whom men hide their faces, despised and we esteemed him not. You remember what John said? Pilate said to the Jews, behold your king. And they did behold. They looked at him. They saw him. Did they cry out? Oh, he's altogether lovely. That's not what they said. Can you see him standing there? Thorns on his brow. A purple robe. I think when you compare all the Gospels, probably that robe was put on after he was scourged. Blood, sweat. See him standing there. I wanted to sing this song. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. You know what they cried out? Folks, what you have to recognize is this. Never had they stood in the presence of one purer or more beautiful or pleasing to God or more willing to save them, more loving, more compassionate, more gracious, more perfect than him. And you know what they cried out? Away with him. Crucify him. Do you hear your mocking voice in that? There was a day, the Christ of Scripture, I had invented a Christ that I was quite happy with. But the one from Scripture, I, I wanted him away. That any of us would find him attractive. It's, it's only shocking to the degree that you come to face to face with the reality of the fact that it's not natural, it's not normal. You know what normal is? What it, they hated me without a cause. That's very normal. He came to his own, his own received him not. That's very normal. You want to find the Antichrist, folks? All you have to do is in your lost state, go over and look in the mirror. We were anti-Christ. We were anti-Christian. We, we were anti-opposed to the God of this book. We were the same. We didn't esteem him. Do you remember how Christ felt to you? you remember how he was? Oh, we hated him. Man, man's natural disposition is such. Can you? Listen. I love drinking. I love partying. And I love being with my wild buddies. I don't know what you were given to, but if you would have walked in and dropped the Song of Solomon on the table where we were all partying, 
it would have been unintelligible to us. Do you recognize the Song of Solomon is a foreign language to this world? If you have the ability, as like Spurgeon said, if you have the ability to look into the pages and find it to be the Holy of Holies, wow, that's, that, that is a miracle. Because you know what? That, it, this is much like the thought that came to my mind is this is much like the parables. You remember what Jesus said? I speak to them in parables. And because hearing, they're not going to understand. Seeing, they're not going to see. It's, it's, it's the same way with this. Now, we look at the parables and we see because the lights have been turned on. But it's the same way with the Song of Solomon. Same way. The reality is this. Christ is not ugly. Christ is not unkind. Christ is not cruel. He is the only Savior. He's God in, in flesh. And listen, listen. Here's the thing. When God the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, do you recognize when he looks at Christ, what he sees and what he says? What did he say? My beloved, like I love him a lot. And he said, with him whom my soul is well pleased. I like that. I want to add that soul part. Not all, not, not each one of the synoptics say that, but, but it's said there. His soul, I am well pleased. My chosen in whom my soul delights is what we find in the Old Testament. Man's great problem, we know what it is. Newton says it. I once was blind, but now I see. You know what? You know these words of Paul. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing what? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, our eyes are blinded. We can't see the glory. The gospel has everything to do with the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you get a feel for what it really means to be an unbeliever? You see, unbelievers believe lots of things. Unbelievers are not people that don't believe anything. Unbelievers believe all sorts of things. And the fact is, unbelievers believe a lot of things that are true. You may have heard me say that before, but that's, a, that's just a reality. We need to recognize that. And you know what? They may even glory in things that are true. They may, they may listen to a Bach concerto and think, well, that, that's just outstanding. That's amazing. They may look, I mean, you may, you may get a microbiologist. He, he sees no glory whatsoever in Christ. But he looks at the DNA, he looks at the RNA, and he's been pressed. He's blown away by it. He's attracted to it. You can take all sorts of people and they look at a mountain range, they look at a sunset, and they're attracted to that. They find it beautiful. But you know what? The unbeliever, the devil has blinded the eyes. And what, what we have to recognize, Adam had no idea. He thought when he bit into the fruit. They thought their eyes were going to be opened. Do you know what actually happened? When he sank his teeth into that fruit, he put daggers in his own eyes. And he suddenly lost the ability to find beauty in his God and in his God's Messiah. He drove those daggers. The thing with him being a representative head is he drove those daggers in our eyes too. You remember what it was like running around? You'd have dropped the Song of Solomon in front of my friends. You'd have started telling us about Christ. We would have saw nothing in it. You know what Paul tells us? He's given his testimony at one point in the later chapters of Acts, and he says this. He said, you know what? I myself was convinced I had to do many things opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's, that's how he viewed him. No, nothing else but to oppose him. And you know what he says? He says in 2 Corinthians, But from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. 
Don't you like that? There was a day when we regarded Christ according to the flesh, but no longer. We see him altogether differently now. How did you view Christ? Young people, you young people here that aren't yet Christians, you know what? We know you. When you think of Christ, you find him ugly. You may not use that word exactly, but you, you know what I find interesting? I, f I find I've listened to these Jewish testimonies, and you know what? They don't want the name of Jesus ever mentioned in the home. That there is such a hatred for Christ. But you know what I find? They will curse and swear and blaspheme and use his name. I have also found this. I have found that even in religion, see, w at least with the Jewish religion, you have some semblance of, of at least Old Testament truth stuck in there somewhere. But you know, when you go to other religions like Hinduism and, and Islam, and you know what's amazing is you find that people in those religions curse Christ just as well. Isn't it amazing? There is such a predominant hatred for the name of Christ in this world. Young people, let me ask you, you got young people back here, where are they? Young people that, you know what you associate with Christ? Because this is what your parents, before we were saved, you know what I associated with him? Thomas, you did too. Bardo, drudgery, oh, religion, popes and priests and beads and holy water and well, I, I mean, I was nominal Catholic, and I, whatever you are and whatever you were, but it was just, it, it was, you know what Christ meant? Something that was going to suck all the fun out of life. Anyone else feel that? That's, a, that's how Christ was, drudgery. Or, or you had this, I remember going over, my, my mom was married to, to my stepdad, and we'd go over to his mother's. It was my step-grandmother. She had this picture of Jesus. Don't you hate pictures of Jesus? Ah, oh, the idea of even going in there and seeing that as a kid was just like so, such a turnoff. Him, you know the one I mean. White-skinned, dove-eyed, these effeminate, long hair, you know, looking up and there's this glow about him, just lacking manliness. Not, not, I, how did you view him? He was just not very real or he just, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps, it, you, you know what, a lot of times we associate it with somebody religious that we knew that's just a flagrant hypocrite and, you know, these, these, but, but the big thing for me was Christ just meant, oh, just, Everything fun, everything enjoyable, everything fulfilling, and all, all the pleasure it was just like, man, following him is just, I guess you got to do it at the end of life, but I'm going to live, live it up now and then just do that detestable, horrible thing of somehow getting right with him because at the end, you know, you got to do it if you don't want to go to hell. Anybody else feel like that? Oh, why do we feel that way? Well, the Scripture tells us he's light. We love the darkness. Our deeds were evil. That's, that's the reason. Blind men, we, just, we didn't have the faculties to appreciate a sunset or a mountain range. That's, what, that's where we were at. We lacked the faculties. We were in the darkness. No ability to perceive. And you know, right there in 2 Corinthians, it says this, God who said, let light shine out of darkness... Isn't that interesting? What Paul does is he says, go back to creation when God created there on the first day and said, let light shine out of the darkness. That same God is shown in our hearts. In other words, he's turned on a light in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, folks, this, is, this is a, takes the same kind of miracle. This is a miracle. The thing is, God called light out of darkness in the beginning. But that wasn't moral darkness. 
He simply put light where there was none. For him to do the change in us, he had to take that which was sinful and, and make us right. It, it's, this, this, is a, this is an amazing thing. Do you know the song? We sang it. I am his and he is mine. Something lives in every hue. That's why we sang it. Christless eyes have never seen. Have you ever thought about those words? Christ, something lives. You see, the songwriter said, did this happen to anybody? I remember when I got saved. Louise, weren't you saying this happened to you? That suddenly, like the sky, you look up at the sky and it's like, you look at people and say, did you ever notice how blue the sky is? Like, what are you talking about? The sky's up there every single day. Any of you feel like that? Like you, like you looked and all of a sudden everything's new. Did, did anybody view the world like that? It's just like, beloved. I mean, you just do you remember what it was like when you carried around in your head Christless eyes and Christless ears? I mean, how did you see Christ? Well, Jesus tells us those who are well have no need of a physician. You know, that's how we were. No need. My Christless eyes, I didn't see any need in him. He said, those who are well, they have no need of a physician. I was very well. There's, there was no need. There was no attraction. I was okay. I could walk around. I could smile. I could live in my sin. I could just go, oh, I could laugh. I could joke. I could party with my buddies. And, and you know what? I didn't tremble. I could, I could actually lay down at bed at night drunk. And I didn't, I didn't tremble. I could casually sin without screaming. Why? Just deceived. I could talk about death and hell with my friends. And, you know, it was all a big joke. Because all, everything was just like a fairy tale. A great gulf opening hell mouth ready to... We, we, just, we just laugh. So confident, so casual, so careless. Why? We, we had no need. No need for a physician. No thought crossed our minds. Oh, let me kiss him. Or let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. I mean, we weren't, what? What? What are you even talking about? Somebody would have come around talking like that. It's like, man, punch that guy in the head. What's wrong with him? Who talks like that? You know what? That's the reality. Who talks like that? And if you suddenly look up and you find, oh, wow, I talk like that. You realize what that means? That means that Christ has set his love on you. I mean, the fact is that, you know what we did? We, we basically brought out the balances. You could throw Christ on one side, and what'd you throw on the other side? Sometimes it's career. Maybe it's like the rich young ruler. Well, I've got my riches, and I'm not giving them up. I've got my freedom. I've got my family. We all pull out the balances. But you know what? Something all of a sudden happens to our Christless eyes. Something happens that's akin to God saying, let the light shine out of darkness. And suddenly, it's like those balances where we put all sorts of stuff, cars and all of our toys and all of our sports and all of our computers and all of our pleasure-seeking and all the sin and all the whatever that we put on the... Is suddenly we beheld Christ and we just thought, what idiots we were. This is how Paul talked. He said, you know what? When it comes to trusting in the flesh and having confidence in that, hey, let me tell you about me. He said, I, I was a Jew of the Jews. I mean, I was circumcised the right day. I was of the right stock. I belonged to the right religious party. I mean, down the line. And he said, one day I looked up and you know what he saw? Everything. He just, he was blown away. Wow. I count it. Excrement is actually the word. Poop. That's what he said. That's what everything is. Everything. When you put Christ in the balances. Isaiah said it. No beauty that we should desire him. We esteemed him not. Oh, our Christless eyes. And you know what? I read this to you. We, did you catch this? 
we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Do you know what Isaiah is saying there? Isaiah is saying, we sing it, stricken, smitten, afflicted, but we need to remember that what's actually being said there in Isaiah is that we esteemed him. So think about this. It doesn't just say that he was stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. It says we esteemed him, but he was pierced for our transgressions. What you need to recognize is that in the context there, what we thought is that God smote him because God hated him just like we hate him. We thought he's an imposter and God punished him for his own sin and his own fault. We thought God let him have it because he's just a criminal. We esteemed that that's what God did to him. God felt about him how we feel about him. But that's not, but, that's, that's, our translations put that in, but that wasn't the case. God didn't do it for him to punish him because he was bad. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. The Lord's laid on him the iniquity of us all, stricken for the transgression of his people. Out of the anguish of his soul, God shall see and be satisfied. He shall make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Oh, and you know what our Christless eyes? If you'd have come told me that 40 years ago, my Christless eyes would have looked at that and those words would have meant nothing. I'd have just said, don't bother me with that religious nonsense. Why? We had it all figured out. A little bit of religion, a little bit of superstition thrown in, a whole lot of self-love, self-righteousness. We're good. And so we invented some watered-down Jesus, not threatening, not very desirable, some baby in a manger, a dead guy on a crucifix on the wall, a name that I know I used it profanely over and over and over. Yes, we had this effeminate, long-haired Jesus. Yes, we heard he died, and we suppose that somewhere or another that must be good, must help us. But you know, after all, we're pretty good people. We esteemed him not. That was us. That was us. Brethren, how did we ever come to the place where suddenly we looked up and we esteemed him? How, what happened to us that we looked up one day and we saw him revealed from the pages of this book and we said, we haven't seen him with these eyes. We saw him in the pages of this book. How is it that suddenly he broke in upon us more beautiful and more precious than we ever imagined. I mean, there was a glory. We suddenly looked up one day and Christ, I mean, just the name, it had a sweetness to it where suddenly if somebody used his name profanely, it was like fingers down a chalkboard. Ah, oh. folks, it wasn't that he suddenly changed where he was not beautiful before, but now he is. You know what happened? You changed. And, and Scripture says we love Him because He first loved us. And what we have to really grasp is that when we look across this whole wide world of ours, all the men and the women and the children out there, they're totally incapable of loving this Christ apart from Christ taking an interest in us and saying, Behold me. Behold me as I am. We begin to see Him in ways we had never seen Him before. That's what happens. There's, there's, there's simply, brethren, left to ourselves. There's, there's simply nothing in us, not natively, that is going to produce love for him. We're, we were willingly. So Jesus said to people, you will not come unto me that you have. We were just willingly hard, willingly blind, willingly we 
don't want to find anything beautiful in him. And you won't unless there is some kind of powerful, effectual drawing of the soul to see Christ for what he is. And it happens at our conversion and it happens afterwards. I mean, brethren, don't you feel it in yourself when we sing the song, Prone to Wander? Or we, we feel in our hearts that there's a, there's a, there's a battle. There's a battle of comp competing affections in this world. It's not just at conversion in the first, but even afterwards, the kind of thing that causes us to gladly run after Christ and to actually hear his voice. Sonny said it, that his, his sheep hear his voice. Do you hear his voice? He's saying, my dove, my beautiful one, my perfect one, come away, come away. He wants he wants you to develop an intimacy with him where this whole thing just becomes deeper. Spurgeon's right. This is for mature Christians. But I'll tell you, if, if you know the Lord and you feel like, oh, I just, I've had fleeting glimpses of this. I've had, I mean, what he's saying. I, I felt maybe little bits, little glimpses, little flashes of light. But, oh, I want so much more. Folks, the fact is that it, if, if, if it wasn't for his influences on us, we would have gladly run straight to hell. And, and a soul's coming to Christ. It's not a product of our power. It's not a product of our free will. It's not, it's, it's not that. It's the result of Christ opening our eyes, Christ giving us, giving us life, giving us a love for him. And, and we looked up one day, and you know what happened? I mean, Christ suddenly we recognize Christ is increasing. You remember how it was with John the Baptist? He must, he must increase. I've got to decrease. And suddenly we looked up one day and it was like Paul. And suddenly, suddenly all of our stuffs and all the stuff we put trust in and all the stuff we used to do. This is why, this is why Christians look like bizarre people to the world. Why don't you do that anymore? Why don't you go there? You got religion. Oh, Christ found me and he opened my eyes. Getting religion sounds sounds like you know what getting religion sounds like you know what happens when people get religion they start tacking moral standards on their life without having this heart of affection for christ you talk about drudgery you know what one time when i was in india i was walking down this road with with a bunch of these young ladies who now are older and they've gotten married and everything and they followed john over to Kathmandu. But there was a day when they were there in Guwahati. And I was over there and we were walking through these villages, down these roads, and every we we passed these villages. And uh we're looking into these. We, we were in an area, you know, there's a huge amount of Islam in this Hindu country of India. And we're walking by these these Muslim villages, and all oh, just the empty stairs you want to see something go look at the hindus and go look at the muslims when they're old the hollow emptiness in their eyes and i'm walking along and we come to a village now these villages when i say village don't imagine like middleton we're, we're talking a group of huts and all the ladies kind of would be doing all their laundry and their cooking and everything out in like a big village courtyard. But as I'm walking by and a, like a road comes off the main road and goes back to this village, suddenly I look at this village and, and it, like their faces are all lit up. It was so obviously different. I said to these girls, what's going on there? And she said, oh, that's a Christian village. Now, look, I don't know how much of that Christianity was real there, but I know this, that that's, I mean, that's, that's what you expect, that kind of brightness that comes on when people suddenly, they all of a sudden, folks, we don't, we don't want the drudgery of religion. We want the gladness. We want the joy, Christ increasing where we, brethren, you know, you know what the greatest thing in the world is? 
to give up your closest idols because your affection and your love and the glory you feel and the preciousness you have for Christ. And, and you can look up like it says here, behold, you are beautiful. That's what she's saying. You know, when you look up and it's like, like Paul, this stuff is excrement. I don't care how glorious it is. I don't care how fantastic in the eyes of this world. But suddenly you look up and there's Christ and he's beautiful. And that's what she says. Behold, you are beautiful. I mean, do, do you remember when that happened? You never use words like precious, like glorious, like worthy, like great with regards to Christ in the same sentence before. And suddenly you were. I was like, where did that come from? And I remember, you know what? I went to high school. My buddies, we were, we were, <laughs> we were the furthest thing from being even religious. But there were a couple of religious guys in the church. There was a Catholic guy and there was another guy that were Protestant. They kind of hung around each other. And we considered those the religious guys. You know, if anybody from, from my class was going to make it to heaven, well, it was going to be these guys. Well, when I got saved, suddenly those two guys were like the first persecutors of me. And I remember I was playing softball and I was walking by the other team and this one of the guys played on that team. And, and he said, he said, hey, Conway, Dave McConey told me that you've... Uh, you become a Jesus freak. This is coming from the guy that we thought was the oddball. He was religious. And I couldn't hardly believe it. Like if I would have thought anybody would have been happy, it would have been like these guys. I said, Kurt, I said, Jesus, save me. How can I be anything other than fanatical for him? I can't even understand your talk. Like how could you even think that way? It's like, if you've got Jesus, aren't you a Jesus fanatic? What are you going to be? A Christian who's a Jesus non-fanatic? Hey, what's that? I mean, she's fanatical. You've, you've become that way. Beautiful. I mean, it's, this is, and what I'm wanting you to see is that when we look up and to us, to you who believe he's precious, that's, to, that's an expression of his love for you to give you that kind of sight to see him. And I don't know how it was with you, but I, I, I mean, I started telling everybody about the beauty and the glory of Christ. And I thought, I really thought this. My friends, when they hear about this, they're just as blind as I used to be. And all they need to do is hear about the glory of this Christ. And they're going to line up. They are going to jump on this bandwagon. This is the greatest thing in the world, this Christ. And then you know what happened. I start telling everybody. And what I discovered, and I imagined that they were suddenly going to have the lights go on with them and see the same beauty, and we were all going to fall down together. But it didn't happen. You refuse to come to me that you may have life. That's, that's basically what happened. But, it, but here's the thing. Some of us he's singled out. And in the almighty demonstration of kindness and his love, Christ breaks through all of our refusal and all of our resistance and makes us willing in the day of Christ's power by some, what, secret, invisible power. What did he do? He just slayed the blindness. He slayed that enmity of our minds. He draws us by just this sweet pull of omnipotence. He drew us. And to take a sinner, I mean, this is, this, this is totally miraculous. Christ touches us and says, see. And it's not just look around like the blind men that he, like John 9. It's what he does is he touches us and he says, behold me. What do you see? And we look and we say, you're altogether lovely. Yep, that's what happens. Brethren, you, you should count it one of the greatest gifts of Christ's love to you when you have a heart that aches for him. Jesus draws us, but not with the chains of a slave, the chains of attraction. And I say to you young people, you know what? We've been on both sides. 
we were where you are now and we thought, ah, oh, this thing is drudgery. This is horrible. I guess we got, well, we're, we're afraid of hell and probably we got to do something one day or do. And the devil's always there whispering, you always have tomorrow. You always have tomorrow. And you know what? A lot of young people end up in hell tomorrow because, but I'll tell you this, Jesus is the one to answer your need. And if blind people went to him and got their sight, you know what he's saying to you? Come to me with your blindness. I am the sight giver. And if you say, Christ does not seem beautiful to me, then I would say this, go to him and confess that and ask him to give you eyes to see his glory. Father, I pray that as we think about this, well, look, Father, we, we know that the world thinks that we're crazy, we're deluded. Science disproves everything, supposedly. The Christ we talk about, they sometimes tell us he doesn't even exist. <laughs> we know that he exists, we know that he's real, and we know that he's beautiful. And the world with all of their mocking and our voices one time were right there with the rest of the mockers and scoffers and we hear our voice. We hear our own voices. We know how we used to talk. But it was you who silenced our tongue. It's you who made us gasp at the beauty that is to be beheld in Christ. And Father, I pray that that would be the course of this church. Father, If I don't know that there's a greater prayer that I could pray for this people than that we would increasingly have our eyes open to behold the glory of Christ and to find him altogether lovely, altogether beautiful, altogether beyond our wildest expectations. Father, please, we ask for that omnipotence, that almighty drawing, that almighty influence to come and cause our eyes, our spiritual eyes to behold such beauties as we have never seen before, to have that increase, to have that be more and more. And I pray that even as the scripture says that your sheep know that voice, they hear that voice. I pray that this, this church would hear the voice of the one who finds them beautiful and perfect. To hear that voice calling them to the secret place, into the place of intimacy, come away. Come away, my dove, my love, my bride, my sister, my garden, my perfect one. I pray that the folks of this church would, would hear the sweet voice of Christ drawing them out there into the place where you will do what John 14, 21 says, love us and manifest yourself to us. Please, Lord, hear us. Even when we meet together, where two or three are gathered together, you promise to meet in that place. We pray that as, as the course of this church takes us into the future, that, that the sweet manifestations of Christ, even corporately, would become more real, more powerful. Please, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.